Well, welcome from Mumbai. The Prime Minister, they're talking about as, uh, the poor and middle class dreams and what the government is doing to uh, give them uh, some sort of fruition. He talked about entrepreneurs becoming job creators then, rather than individuals looking for jobs. He also talked about housing, education, liberating citizens from income tax. The larger question, of course, is uh, will there be growth which will pull and sustain the, uh, these ambitions and these hopes? And more importantly, how will this play out? Well, that's what we're going to talk about here in the next half an hour or so. I'm uh, joined by four special guests, Vimal Bhandari, Managing Director of Indostar Capital Finance, Dr. Brinda Jagidhar, former Chief Economist at State Bank of India, Frank D'Souza, tax partner at PwC, and Ashir Kapoor, uh, founder and MD at EPPS. Thank you all for joining me. Uh, Brinda, let me begin with you. So we've obviously seen a lot of uh, focus on the agriculture and investment side. We've seen uh, specific schemes. We've take, seen a high uh, allocation for Narega. We've also seen uh, a clear number when it comes to uh, infrastructure and roads and railways, more than two lakh crore. What is this adding up to in your mind? All this is clearly adding up to growth and employment as the key themes, supported by sub-themes. But the main thing is the focus is on growth, growth from agriculture and rural. The second vertical is infrastructure mainly. And the third is ease of, through ease of doing business. And the fourth is supporting this growth through the financial sector. So clearly all this adds up to growth which creates employment. And along with this, the fiscal consolidation which he has announced in this year and the roadmap that he has announced for fiscal consolidation, I think these are very, very big positives. And uh, these going forward would sustain the growth. Okay. Uh, Vimal? No, I think it's a socially transformative budget because there is a very high socialistic orientation in the budget, which, as Brinda very rightly said, I think if there's a tinge of disappointment, it is that there's not much in the corporate sector in terms of accelerating the pace of investment. Uh, some of the things which the corporate sector was looking forward to, like the reduction in the corporate tax rates, or in fact, the tax rate has gone up because certain benefits have been withdrawn and the tax rates remain where it is. I think better amelioration of the bad debt problem because 25,000 crores is inadequate for the banks to lend to the sector. So some of the social schemes which especially the people... So put that in context, we're saying 25,000 crore against 8 lakh uh, crore with uh, the, the, whole the whole But at least people are expecting 50, 70, 50 to 75,000 crores to come in. Now there have been, you know, whether there is some other, as per the National Economic Survey, whether there's some further talks going on with RBI to put more capital because at 25,000 crore banks will be severely hampered in terms of a lendable capacity right. to the manufacturer. Okay. Let, let me get some quick points sure. first, Frank. Yeah, so uh, if you look at from a direct tax perspective in terms of some of the themes and echoing what uh, Vimal was saying, from a corporate perspective, uh, the whole issue was in terms of the withdrawal of exemptions and how you marry that with the uh, reduction in the corporate tax rate. And with a four-year roadmap, it was always going to be an issue in terms of which year do you give more and which year do you take more. And I think in this year, uh, the government has taken more than what it has given. Uh, the other theme out here, of course, is the fact that uh, they do want the supposed rich to pay more and uh, put a little more money in what they consider to be the middle class or the lower middle class. So there are schemes and exemptions which are uh, focused on that. And uh, at least some thought which has been given to uh, dispute resolution, and we need to talk about that a little more and uh, elements to do with how the BEPS recommendation for international taxation have been introduced. Right. Okay. So we'll talk about the individual as well in a little bit. Uh, Ashit, broadly as a startup, what, what's your takeaway? So I think uh, overall the kind of investment the government is going to do in the infrastructure and the uh, agricultural sector, I think is going to give a big boost, uh, uh, you know, to the common man and, and mm -hmm. that and along with uh, the benefits that the government is passing on to the common man with, uh, you know, rebate in the HRAs and everything should be a, should give a very big boost to, uh, right. to the industry as a whole. Right. Okay. So, Frank, the Prime Minister also spoke about housing and, and he said that by providing this HRA exemption, by focusing on low-cost housing, so actually the, the small taxpayer or the, or, the, or the citizen is better off now after this budget than before. There are two, three clear elements out there. One, of course, is the HRA bit which you spoke about. This is really for individuals who are not employed mm. and who are claiming a deduction. That uh, overall benefit has significantly increased. So though for those who are self-employed and were claiming exemption as far as rentals are concerned, the other benefit which has come in is in respect of rebate. For the small taxpayers, if your income was below 5 lakhs, you used to have a rebate of 2,000 that has gone up to 5,000. 
there is some level of additional... So what does that exactly mean in your hand? It means uh, 3,000 rupees more, more because you're going to pay 3,000 less of taxes. Okay. So that is effectively what's going to happen per year. Per year. Okay. So that's, that's really what it is. Uh, if you're able to claim the HRA that is going up, I believe, from 24 to 60,000, so that's, so whatever is the differential, the benefit on that. There have been other uh, schemes which have uh, kind of matured in terms of presumptive taxation for small uh, businessmen. If you had a turnover, I believe, only up to a crore, then you could presumptively pay tax up to a particular amount on the assumption that 8% was the overall profit. That has now been increased to 2 crores for the first time. As far as professionals are concerned, uh, how many will use it is a different matter. Uh, if your overall in turnover was 50 lakhs, then you can, without having to prove your deductions and other expenses, assume that your profit was in the region of 50% and go ahead and pay tax so on that. So how much would that be? So uh, typically 30% or 50%, yeah. looking at 7.5 uh, lakhs is what you would pay mm. if you have up to 50% of income. Right. So, but if you pay that 7.5 lakhs, then you're done. You have no further... Yeah, then you're done. To, of okay. course. Yeah. The element that you still will need to substantiate is that your turnover in the year indeed has been only 50 lakhs because mm -hmm. that is something in terms of how that gets addressed is, is a different issue altogether. Okay. Basically under the terms of ease of doing yeah. business. Yeah. So, Vimal, let's take yeah. a step back. So, sure. if you look at the architecture, that's yeah. the term we were discussing earlier, yeah. what does this look like? I mean, is this a growth-oriented budget? It is, to my mind, a consumption-led budget mm -hmm. where they're trying to put more purchasing power in the hands of to my, you know, in a nutshell, people who have an annual income of 20 lakhs and below. Mm. So that is one very major thing which is working on. If the infrastructure game plays out and, you know, and the trickle-down effect happens, then that could be the only investment engine which will create more demand and more economic growth. General manufacturing or other sector investments from the corporate sector may not be that much easily forthcoming. Why and is that? I don't think there's much in terms of ameliorating the problems of the uh, manufacturing but sector. But could the budget have done something? I think in terms of further demand improvement or giving some accelerated tax benefits for investments. Mm -hmm. In fact, accelerated depreciation has gone away, but we know maybe an investment along. Just so that, you know, we kickstart the cycle because there's very little equity mm -hmm. left. The second big issue is that if the interest rates come down, which is expected, and the banks are again in the mood to lend, then there may be certain lendable capacity. Thirdly, the Democles ward of uh, the NPA, mm -hmm. The proof will lie in how it plays out in the next six months because there are a lot of anxiety in the corporate sector how it will have a ripple effect right. on the overall lending scenario. So I think overall a lot will depend on how the infrastructure sector plays out because I think the major thrust in terms of new investments is only in the public investments in the infrastructure sector. Under the PPP format they have done a lot of changes which will make ease of doing business in the PPP format. The million dollar question is from the private sector, who would have the capacity to take up some of these PPP? And you're saying the budget really doesn't do much it in that regard. So, uh, Brinda, one of the issues that we, as we went into this budget, was agrarian stress. Now, this budget has obviously done a lot. I mean, it opened with uh, the focus on agriculture, a whole lot of schemes. Is this, in your mind, adding up to something that will significantly change the lot of so many farmers almost, or so many people dependent on agriculture, which is more than half the population. Definitely, because the, government, the finance minister clearly said, we are moving away from food security to income security. And uh, so it's just, it's how to increase the production, productivity at the farm level, the soil, irrigation, etc. And also giving them a platform, the e-marketing uh, e yeah. platform. So I think all this adds up to actually empowering. So the question I'm trying to ask is, do you see it as a significant move or as an incremental move? I see it as a significant move, mm -hmm. certainly, because mm -hmm. this, these are very important transformative steps for the rural sector. Mm -hmm. And as Bimal had just said, just now that this is really, we need to revive the demand in the rural sector. Urban demand had been so long holding up a bit, but rural demand in the last two years, given the bad monsoons, had really slumped. So we need to get that back and we need to get the sentiment back. But back we're also in the rural looking at a situation where, let's say, world food prices are low. Uh, how, how do you then uh, increase support price or increase prices for farmers here? or find other ways of ensuring that they're... It's not just the price. It's actually the production, productivity, and the distribution channels. Because sometimes you find in the prices, the production goes up and prices crash. That is something we need to avoid. So the government is going to step in for procurement also, and I think they're putting pulses on the procurement list. So things like this, these are the steps which they take to actually have a stability in the sector, not just a one-time off.
Okay. And added to this could be the benefit from the affordable housing, because they've taken big steps on affordable, at least from a developer's point of view, they're giving them a tax holiday, notwithstanding they've added mat in the fine print. Hmm. And from the borrower's point of view, there's certain interest subvention. If with slightly better agrarian outlook and affordable housing creating more employable or productive opportunities in the upcountry market, it could have a little more positive and a quick uh, impact in, in terms of the economic growth. Right. So you're saying, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. And even the announcement with respect of FDI to allow food processing. Uh, Marketing. So that, that is going to 100%. And the of course, we're talking about approvals. So that, that really helps in terms of putting some level of structure to the overall infrastructure in place. Okay. So let's spend a moment on tax administration. So one of the you know, issues that even in the last budget that was mentioned was you know, doing away with an adversarial tax regime. Now, we were talking to guests in the morning. The general feeling was that going into this budget, even before we actually came uh, to this point, we've seen several circulars, several announcements, which seem to be headed in that direction. Uh, looking at the commitment that the finance minister has made uh, in the context of retrospective tax, do you feel that we are now taking significant steps as opposed to uh, incremental steps that we were taking earlier? So there are two elements of this in terms of the administrative ease. Mm. Uh, one was in respect of an ongoing basis, how do you ensure that people don't fork out taxes more than they actually need to because we have an extremely stringent uh, withholding tax regime in this country. And the recommendations on Ishwar Committee uh, report in terms of how you increase the threshold and reduce the withholding rate, I believe it has been accepted. I have not done a mapping in terms right. of uh, each to each. The other element is in, in, is in connection with where taxes are owed or refunds are owed by the government to the taxpayer. And invariably there are delays. Uh, at least it has now specifically been brought out that any delay beyond nine months increases the interest rate from six to nine percent. And interestingly, a comment made by the finance minister that the officer would be responsible for it. So whatever that means uh, needs to be seen. However, uh, the other big um, bugbear of uh, the, the, the corporate taxpayers and other taxpayers has been the amount of time it takes for us to litigate in this country and reach a resolution. And when the finance minister started off by saying that we will bring in something to resolve the, uh, the, the uh, dispute uh, process, um, it has effectively boiled down to the fact that the taxpayer pay the taxes which are demanded of them uh, and they will not be levied penalty. Uh, in some cases they could be if the threshold of the taxes are higher, which in, in, in my mind I'm curious in terms of uh, is that too much loaded in favor of the revenue. And lastly, coming to... So, uh, why do you say that? Is it because that if someone, uh, the income tax authorities slap a case on me, uh, I, don't, I, I don't have a, uh, an opportunity to contest it on merit, but I can actually settle it if I want to? Yes, you can settle it if you want yeah. to. But there's no opportunity to contest it on merit, or no, I have you to take can. that chance? You, you, you still have the opportunity to contest it on merit. Mm. Uh, admittedly, there have been cases in the past where a taxpayer would like to pay off the tax and get on with life. Many a times he, he didn't do that because there was this whole issue in terms of whether then he would be slapped with penalty because if, if, mm. if he were to accept the adjustment. There are two things which have been done as far as that is concerned. One is that if the overall tax demand is below a particular threshold, there will be no levy of penalty. Secondly, even if it's above a particular th uh, threshold, penalty could be levied. But the other important change is that the amount of penalty that can be levied, which was 100 to 300 percent, is now being brought down starting from 50 percent and there will be certain conditions which will be met. But beyond all of this, beyond all of this, there are genuine cases of disagreements with the taxpayer in terms of the taxation. Okay, That is not going to get resolved by uh, the provisions that the minister is seeking to introduce. So how would you, uh, if you were to aggregate the steps announced in today's budget in terms of easing uh, the interaction with, with taxpayers, how would you rate it then? I would say it's a, it's, it's a positive step. It is a move in the right direction and I would imagine depending upon how this actually plays out, the subsequent budgets and ministers would find some kind of courage to see in terms of how do they put, as the Prime Minister said, a little more confidence in the taxpayers in, in, in setting this right. So these are steps, these are not big bold step but these are starting steps and, and which the, are necessary. The Prime Minister himself talks about liberating the taxpayer. Exactly. I mean, that's pretty exactly. significant in some ways. Absolutely. Okay, so he, uh, the other thing is the, uh, the uh, it's, I don't know if the amnesty is the right word, but clearly 
what the finance minister said that domestic taxpayers can declare undisclosed income and uh, by paying tax at 30% and surcharge at 7.5 and penalty at 7.5, uh, which is a total of 45%. So is, is that a great move? I think it will be good for those Sign of who, you know what, maybe at the cusp of wanting to come clean. Yeah. Obviously, the equity of it will need to be seen in the implementation of the plan. But uh, after a long time, we are having this kind of uh, no question. How, how would you categorize it? Is it a, like a VDIS or an amnesty or I th somewhere in between? I would say it's more like an amnesty. Okay. Because you come clean and move on. Mm. Uh, you know, so VDIS, you know, was similar, but, you know, I think... The main worry which everyone always has is that while this finance minister may say there will be no investigation subsequently, <laughs> once you have declared, whether that will be the thin end of the wedge to start doing some investigation. So I think a lot of people who are at, just at the marginal cases, they may want to just come clean. Frank? Yes, the, the, the other element overlay on this is the fact that uh, we had the scheme last year. The, the overall uh, taxes were 60%, 60%, tax plus interest mm, and yeah. penalty. And now it's been brought down to 45 uh, will, will someone be waiting along the lines to see whether the 45 reduces further for me to disclose? So, uh, but in terms of uh, an effort, it it's, seems to be laudable because you're trying to widen the tax net. And once you're in the net, you're in the net, isn't it? Right. In that's theory. true. That's true. In, in, in theory, that's the case. And therefore, we have had VDIs coming in in one form or the other since 1955. So those schemes have been there. But do, do expect some level of activism from the yeah. honest taxpayers in terms of are they getting penalized? for uh, an Anderson issue which comes up every time when you have uh, an amnesty of this kind. Ashit, how would you feel like an honest taxpayer at, in a, at a juncture like this? <laughs> yes, definitely. <laughs> but I still feel that uh, these kind of uh, processes will get in a lot of money uh, into the system and, you know, help the government invest and get and give more back to the society and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, in the end benefit the business to grow. Okay. So you're saying it's 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 a good cause it's and therefore should cause be and, uh, and at least for yes. some. Yes, and I think it should be it taken should not forward. Have a wrong signaling to the honest tax. Yeah. But even the economic survey has said only five percent of the population pays income tax. So yeah. I think we need to really widen the tax net. But were you expecting, or would you have liked something beyond this? No, I think for the for now, I think this is fine. And we go, slowly we need to expand the tax tax net. That's for sure. Right. So let's talk about simplification and rationalization. I mean, I'm trying to go in at least Absolutely. the key points in the under tax. Uh, in the same order as the finance minister did. So he's talked about removing 13 cesses, which used to only net 50 crores, but there are also some new cesses that have come yeah, in. In fact, there are quite a few new ones, and it's difficult on a cursory reading to see how many new cesses have come. And frankly, it begs the question, why have so many cesses, if you might as well increase one slab rate, and that's mm. the end of it. Because every year we have five new cesses coming in, and five new cesses going on. At the end of the day, the taxpayer pays the cess and doesn't know what is being done with the money. Mm. The second, which he has done more in fine print and its impact needs to be seen, is the rationalization of the long-term pension and savings plan. Mm. Because uh, first time we are saying that any provident fund contribution above one and a half lakhs, it will be limited to one and a half lakh. Mm. So that, you know, in terms of what does it do, it, A, to the taxpayer who is saving more, more importantly to the long-term savings platform because that's one of the hallmarks of trying to increase financial sector savings. But what could be the reasoning behind that? The reasoning could be that we want to ensure that people keep their provident funds where they should be. But he's only allowing you now one and a half lakhs as employer contribution. Right. So previously, you know, the, the larger savers, which they came out in the economic survey also, is the higher income guy. It should not so happen that many of them shy away from putting in provident fund and long-term saving. Beyond this, obviously, the details have yet to come out. Mm. But a cursory reading of the and understanding the, uh, the finance minister's speech seems that if you have more than one and a half lakh employer contribution, it will be taxed as a perk. So, no, that's on one end. On the other hand, I, the, on the, the withdrawal itself, yeah. On the withdrawal itself, he has made it 40, which could be because he does not want people to withdraw and then reinvest it in the PFSO to create a long-term core savings. Mm. So that could be a much better rationalization from an overall long-term savings platform. But your, your problem is, is with the, the fact that it's being treated as a problem. Yeah, because it should not happen that people should, not, should stop saving enough for the long term because he's talked of income security for the old age. Mm. So we will have to see when the fine print comes out in terms of what was the underlying rationale. Because it is a reality that the higher income guys are the ones who save a lot in the provident fund which the government uses for its various social okay. and infrastructure platform. Right. And, and you're generally, you feel, Vimal, that this has been a little unfair to the super rich? Yeah, if you read all the fine print and all, then, you know, the honest taxpayer who's at the upper end of the income curve hmm. definitely could feel a little uh, short chain because those who don't pay that much and still earn have anyway got away and as marks, you know, they've had this uh, whole thing about the amnesty scheme also. Hmm. Hmm. 
So I think maybe between the dividend tax, the, the surcharge on the income, the various cesses, and the uh, EPFO, maybe the higher income salaried employee could feel that maybe he's been asked to carry a but little more. But walk us through, what is the impact on the super rich? Uh, I mean, obviously the... I think it's just a question of equity. Has it, it, surcharge has gone up. The EPFO it depends, you mm. know, how that, mm. that has gone up. Cesses are common for everyone, but it's more for the higher income guy. So I think it's just a question of equity. That is, uh, you know, at the end of the day, one doesn't grudge if the money is going for the benefit of the larger society. But then, as Brinda said, we should bring more and more people into the tax net. So there's a more equitable distribution of the burden among people who can afford to pay but don't disclose their income. Okay, Frank, super so rich. So one of the interesting, okay, so the super rich part, I think the other elements uh, which has come in is the fact that if you're now going to uh, spend on buying any car which is 10 lakhs or more, you need to pay a 1 lakhs tax at source. Uh, if you're going to get any services in cash or purchase any goods in yeah. cash which is in excess of 2 lakhs, mm -hmm. you still, uh, you, you go ahead and pay 1% tax, of course you will get credit for those taxes, but I, 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 I think the point does remain, and coming to Brinda's point in terms of getting more people into the net, is there is a um, uh, uh, focus by the government in terms of how does one go about collecting information in terms of for transactions which are taking place, so that they are then able to look at it, mine that data, and see how do we go after those individuals. So if I pay 1% tax and I'm going and buying a car which is more than 10 lakhs, tomorrow they come to me and ask me, ask, explain the source right. of this, then I'm able to do that. For people who are not able to, that is how they will then get across in terms of uh, bringing them into the tax net. Right. Okay, so we need to go in for a break. Before that, Ashit, let me get a last word from you in. What's your sense? If, are you feeling happy at the end of this budget? Do you feel it's genuinely yeah, supportive feel... of... New enterprises. Are you happy with the tax breaks? You may yeah, not I think I, I'm, I'm quite happy with this uh, okay. with this budget. Uh, the kind of inf uh, uh, emphasis the government is uh, putting on, uh, you know, growing the middle uh, middle sector. Mm -hmm. So that's that's quite good for the company. Is there one thing that you would have liked to see which you perhaps have not seen, at least from your first reading? Uh, no, nothing as of now. That is. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and, and that's a very good note to end on. We need to take a break here, but we'll come back. You're watching this special coverage on the Union Budget 2016. Stay with us.